basically, these are the one thing that I want to tell the organic farmers. I think you should really plant them. I think they really fit. Figure out how to grow them. I think they're an excellent crop for you. I think there are, there's a shortage of them. They're a very good protein source. Our, our livestock person, Vern Anderson, Dr. Vern Anderson, who is now has holding the tour, has been doing extensive work feeding peas, not organically, but they are such a good feed. The industry, I know, wants them. There's a high value to them. They're a non-GMO protein source that's readily available. They work so good in our rotation with small grains. I think our data shows it. What we have going here now is because industry, Byron, Byron Lenoy from Pulse USA, if you don't know what that is, that's a farmer-owned seed company that really got going because North Dakota produces a lot of peas, lentils, and chickpeas and other crops, but we had no seeds. So this is a farmer-owned seed company that sources varieties out of Europe and other places and then makes them available to farmers through various methods. So, but, but what this project is, is highlighting, is industry, Pulse USA, and a farmer, Blaine Spaltz, as a seed grower, are working together to select experimental lines out of here, the ones that aren't labeled, to make them exclusively adapted to organic. They'll explain that. I'm going to introduce them to you and get going. But before we do that, I worked with Byron this winter a little bit. He is talking about this. And he keeps calling me, or NDSU, the other university, so guess where he might have went to? Uh -oh. <laughs> Maybe I'll <laughs> Well, I told him, Maybe if this all goes through, Byron, an organic NDSU t-shirt. He told me he would wear it. <laughs> the other school, okay? <laughs> it's, like, it's like they tell me, when my, when my daughter was under the knife, and she was waking up, and the doctor from UND told me, he says, if you want, we have a saying up there, if you want to own the farm, go to UND. If you want to work on the farm, go to NDSU. <laughs> <laughs> it's yours, guys. Well, I'm Byron, and this is Blaine. Uh, Blaine has grown seed for Pulse USA for quite a while. Uh, so you can bring the farmer aspect of it. I myself was a farmer, too, for... 25 years, 26 years. Um, I've been involved in field peas for over probably 12 or 20 years. And I do a lot of the selections for our company and other companies as well. So I work with breeders from basically throughout the world. Uh, New Zealand, Canada, US, Europe. There's not a lot of pea breeders left, but the companies that do do a lot of the pea breeding have uh, basically all merged together. And I think if you look at the lines that we've got out here, when I first originally started, we couldn't get a pea to stand up. And now it's like we've got to choose between the cream of the crop on a lot of things. And what brought me, I guess, probably into the organic industry was growers like uh, Blaine. Um, I've got some other growers I work with as well. But the industry's big. I mean, it's... Yeah, yeah, I looked at some figures. In 1990, the sales were one one billion, I think, in the organic industry. Right now, this year, I think we're at 30 billion in sales. There's a lot of companies that don't pay attention to you guys. We're not a huge company. I like to work with people like Steve. I like to work with people like Blaine. You guys bring a whole whole different aspect of farming, I guess, to me, and I'm really interested in it. Uh, I'm interested in soil health. I think when we do start to have some serious breakdowns in our egg networks uh, due to overuse of fungicides, fertilizers, chemicals, all different kinds of things, people like Blaine are going to be one step up, probably a lot more than one step up the ladder, to be way up when things start to fail. I see all the uh, conventional farming, I see band-aid approaches to fix everything that they've wrecked all the way along the way. Uh, I come out here and look at, at uh, Steve's wonderful plot that in the past few years has been out yielding the conventional here at the station, I believe, hasn't it, Steve? And look, you know, no herbicide, you know, you can probably count maybe one, two, three mustards out there and that's about it. So it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Um, I have access, like I said, to genetics from all over the world. And I look at some years, hundreds of varieties. One of the, I'm not, I'm not a plant breeder. I'm not intelligent in that part of the uh, aspect of this. 
but I am really good at making selections. One of the breeders I work with very closely has always told me don't waste a lot of time picking your varieties because you already walked past the best one. <laughs> so I've learned a lot from that statement. And I think what that statement tells me too is in what I do select, every year I'm throwing away probably the best ones. So I've got all these super good varieties that I guess I am offering to you guys. I've seen a breakdown somewhat, I thought, in the organic seed community where, let's just use DS Admiral, which is one that Blaine has grown for years. If they can't find an organic DS Admiral, if the growers can't find it, they'll make a few calls around and then maybe they're going to find a conventional DS Admiral. What I would like to give you guys is your own variety. organic, call it centennial or something, your organic centennial, so when you're going to condition your market, your end users, to say centennial, they're going to ask for centennial, they're going to know it's organic, that's just a fictional variety. I think it's going to jumpstart your whole seed industry, I think it's going to give your end users a whole lot of faith in what they're buying. When they buy certain products, they want that product. There's different cook times. You know, everything reacts differently. Um, if they're doing any splitting of the peas, the loss is more on some, less on others. DS Admiral is one of the best ones for lack of loss when they split. We've got, I've got a variety down here on the end, one of my new ones. Actually, it's the first time I've even seen it this year, and it looks awesome. It's, I think, about four or five from the end down there. You know, and that's what I'm bringing to you guys is things like that. Uh, it's going to be a, a help to uh, Blaine. It's going to be help to all of you that are growing them. You know, we're going to pick the best of the best that's going to stand good, going to branch out good. Um, you know, quality is another thing. You know, if, you know, quality is basically one of my number one, uh, and agronomics are right in there as well. Um, you know, we've got varieties, we've got Matrix with Blaine as well, which is maybe not the best quality green pea in the world, but it's probably one of the highest yielding peas that you can get your hands on. Uh, we've got a little spot in Minnesota where we grow that one, that they get 100 bushels per acre almost every year out of that pea, and just in that certain Peas are, uh, they're sensitive to geographics, so we have to be cognizant of that fact when we move them 100 miles away, maybe 200 miles away, they're going to do different things. So it's going to take some varieties and it's going to take some time to fill the needs of everyone. Uh, hopefully I can find a DS Admiral that we can geographically relocate all over. We probably sell peas in probably 60% of the U.S. buys peas from us. Uh, we're a small company, but we do move some pretty large volumes. We're getting to be more of a distributor, I guess, than a retailer. And I think now I'll turn over to Bland, and you know I've told you what we're going to try to bring forward to you guys. I think it'll be a great help to you, and I think Bland can uh, bring some of the aspects from him, what, what he thinks about the whole deal. Uh, my name is Blaine Schmaltz. I actually farm up in Rugby, North Dakota area. And uh, anyway, first of all, I'd like to, to thank Steve for assisting me as part of my uh, selection grant uh, to help all of you get a pea variety that we can call our own. Steve provided the resource of the research center here to do that. And uh, I thank him for doing that because this is probably the most efficient way and uh, that all of you can actually even assist in, in some of these decisions. Um, also, Byron, uh, I need to thank Byron specifically and Pulse USA for stepping up to the plate uh, some time ago when uh, he realized the magnitude of uh, the usage of the organic uh, uh, producers in using, being able to utilize field peas. He, he came a step forward and said, hey, what can I do to help? And I always kind of kept that in the back of my mind, and, and, and I guess when the time came, 
and I, uh, I suggested that maybe we start doing some P varietal development uh, that we could call maybe our own. Uh, he stepped right up to the plate right away and offered. So Byron, I thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so anyway, we have some selections. Like you said, sort of working with Byron, the, the real importance is his access to all of the breeders and all the European seed stock. And uh, without that, you, you have to have your breeders be able to uh, bring you material that you can even work with. And we, we got our material a little bit late this year, so I didn't even get to put any of it on my farm. He had just enough to pull off some of these trials. So uh, what you see here is, is all we're going to have this year, right, Byron? And so we're going to try this selection process. Um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll enter into why maybe that I even thought about seeds uh, pea seed, not just because I was a seedsman, but we sort of took, we had a lot of alfalfa in our rotation. And we chose to take alfalfa out of our rotation for many, many reasons. Up on the north where I was at, we had a really hard time getting number one quality alfalfa off and getting it to the dairies like they wanted it. And so we needed to have a good nitrogen soil building resource. And I wanted to have one that was early enough that would adapt to the, uh, the cold climates. A pea seed can take uh, between 20 and 23 degrees uh, in mornings. And uh, I mean, that's, there's not a lot of crops we can do that without dying. The, gro the growing point is below the ground, so that's why that works that way. So I started raising peas, and then I feed was a concern because I was a livestock producer, and uh, I would I would uh, plant peas with oats to start out with and I would watch those the cattle just dig into them bales and clean them up and I wouldn't have to grind them or do anything. And I thought, my oh my, what, what, what do we have here? So not only was it a rotational uh, soil building crop, but it actually provided nutrients for the animals that's uh, right now today. Uh, any of you that probably market to any organic valley people, they can't get enough peas which they blend with their barley and corn rations right now. And so there's huge potential growth. I, I, I mean, the, the phone rings all the time. Do you have peas? Do you have peas? Do you have peas? Because it's a great protein source. It's somewhere between 25 and 27% for most varieties. Uh, so those were sort of the concerns of why, you know, I want to present to you, the organic producers, the value of this crop in your rotation. It's a great companion crop with things like barley and oats and addresses a lot of feed needs as companion. I, Byron sort of briefly mentioned about how I do DS Admiral. Well, DS Admiral was developed by, by Pulse USA, and it sort of ended up to be a variety like, uh, you know, you have wheat varieties that you can move around all over and they kind of turn out the same. Well, DS Admiral happened to be one of those. So when I started promoting it in seed sales and people wanted a companion crop with barley, I was doing that also at the same time to understand how it would perform. We've never ever had let us down when I've companion cropped it with another crop. It matures, uh, it stays at a really uniform height. It doesn't grow too high, so it wants to lodge down like some of your forage pea varieties had a tendency to do what we were all used to. And it also has sort of what you call once it starts to hit maturity, once the top third of the branches start to turn on you, you really get a limited time, but it works so perfect with barley because barley is also the same way. And you take them down together and they cure together real nicely. And if you ever have to sort out, if you have it in your, even if you used it with companion with rye or oats and you ever need to sort it out, it separates so nicely. You have this large round seed versus a long elliptical seed and they separate it. In any pre-screening process, they can separate it real nicely. Byron, is there anything else that I needed to touch on? We've yeah. always called them the miracle crop, you know, with the nitrogen they do, and they actually change the texture of your soil. Yep. Uh, yeah. Time. I, I think, you know, I would probably pick buckwheat number one, changing the texture of soil, but I would pick a pea as being number two in, in what it does for soil health. And, uh, you know, and another nice thing that I won't, that I, w I need to mention to you is, is that because of the earliness of this crop, it allows you to plant on that ground a nice cover crop. And you can even use the volunteers from this crop that you have, might have harvest loss on as part of the seed process. But it, it works so nice because it's so early and you can get the job done. There's not a lot of other bean varieties because they're all warmer season that you can pull it off and do it. 
So I would say that's probably, you know, really, really big benefit for the future. Um, Your yield increase usually following peas is pretty stable as well. Yes, it was, I was used to being a dry bean grower and so we, we fertility check and all that stuff and I am getting more nitrogen benefit out of a pea than I do out of a dry bean. So they all have, you know, faba bean I think is number one. You know, there's, there's different ones that are, but a, but a dry pea always gives me about the best possible nitrogen source. How, many, how much nitrogen are you fixing? You know, it's going to vary. First of all, you should inoculate. I think even when you have inoculum in the soil, a pea, because it's so early, I think you need to inoculate it every time, right, Byron? Yeah, pea rhizobia is the weakest rhizobia there is. Yes, yeah. So that, so like if you seeded a soybean or a dry bean, sometimes if that rhizobium is in your soil and you're in a warmer climate, that rhizobium will stay. Um, at least you'll have some residual. They they are now still inoculating to make sure they have uh, make sure they have the benefit of doing that. I usually on my test get about 40 pounds, and I don't know if that's an average, but. With my rotation, everything I get 40 pounds of usable N, uh, organic matter N, out of that crop. And that's actually pretty good. You can get higher if you have higher yields. It all goes accordingly, like that. Um, there's another variety. They all do vary. You'll, you'll see some of the peas um, have large, robust seed, seeds. And so part of the thing is, is that when you're starting to look at seed costs, some of the pea seed is larger. And it really depends on the year a little bit, and that can affect your decisions on maybe a pea seed that you may choose or not choose to do. But you also, there's another factor in pea seed. You may choose to do a variety that's of the green color that doesn't have the tannins of the, of the yellow, because that also goes for food, not only feed. I didn't touch on that enough on the food part of it. So you have a dual purpose pea that you have feed or food or seed. I just want to address his question there, Blaine, for a second. Um, from work that's been done on this farm for a number of years, looking at it more as a cover crop aspect, and some recent work that I'm still doing and evaluating his, uh, Byron, and other people's lines as a forage. So therefore, as a cover crop forage, to answer your question, how much nitrogen, basically, and this is done unconventional now, whether it's different or organic, I don't know, but basically in 60 days, from when I plant them in the spring to when I green manure them, measure that biomass and, and calculate the nitrogen in the above ground, I'm not doing the roots. That takes the soil scientists. Something I can't do because there's they say there's 25% more in the roots in the below ground biomass. And, but but above ground biomass, if I calculate yield, dry matter yield, and measure the nitrogen, I can figure in 60 days 90 to 110 pounds of nitrogen. That's what I figured because you know Gabe, he's been doing a lot of stuff. Peas are probably, again, based off of the data, I mean, hairy vats, you can't beat it. That's the number one. But there's a little bit of a challenge and stuff, too. If you want to look at the least amount of time, most adapted in North Dakota, cover crop, green manure, and fixed nitrogen is probably peas. And that probably explains why, you know, if we grow a cereal crop after the pea and the rotation, it, it's virtually like an alfalfa because you, the crop never, ever denitrificates that you ever see the yellowing in a crop. I, I've never had it happen on a pea crop. So obviously there's other nit unmeasurable nitrogen that we are not measuring. The oats as an example, that's third year crop after peas. Peas were on there last year. Yeah, you usually get, you know, multiple years yeah. all in peas. You get a bonus. I always say it's not a one year crop. Right. And, and when you do soil tests, you're going to have an, an acid or, or a, a alkaline extraction on it. Yeah. And so that's going to be a different than what you actually have in the ground. Right now. 